Okay, so uh, let's begin uh, with an introduction. An introduction to the course. Uh, we call it theology proper, and I will soon be defining what we mean by uh, theology. But let me begin by saying John Calvin, have you all heard about John Calvin? He said knowledge begins with the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. If you would know as you ought to know, you ought to know about God and you ought to know about yourself. It is sometimes unclear which one comes first. Calvin begins with the knowledge of God before he speaks about the knowledge of self. And what Calvin is ultimately saying is that because we are made in the image of God, we can't know anything truly unless we are, unless we are in the know in terms of God. We can't know anything truly unless we realize that we are contextualized in the being of God. This being the case, to be truly human is to be theocentric. In other words, it's to be God-centered. And to be truly human uh, means we must be God-focused. Otherwise, we can't really be human. We, we are made in the image of God. We can almost not run away from that fact. We will always have that image in us, not that image about us. We can't be human without being defined in terms of that image. Now, if that is true, then we can only be fully human to the extent that we are centered on God and to the extent that we are focused on God. Humans cannot really know when they are apart from God. Every action of humankind is connected in some way to God. And for that reason, according to R.C. Sproul, uh, he's written a book called Everyone is a Theologian. Um, that's the title of the book, and he was right in so saying. Because everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone has this God consciousness. Now, whether they acknowledge it or not, they are theologians. Which brings us to the question, what is theology? What is theology? The term theology comes from the Greek word theologia, theologia, which is made up of two words, theo from theos, which means God, logia from logos, which means words or speech. So we can, if we bring the two words together, we can come up with a meaning, a literal meaning, words about God, speech about God. Sometimes we simply say the study of God or the theory of or about God. That's what theology is. Uh, Aurelius Augustine of Hippo, he understood theologia to mean, and I quote, an account or explanation of the divine nature. It's just another way of saying an account or an explanation of God. 
We also say theology is an exposition of all the truths about God and his relationship to the world and to man as recorded in the Bible. So all the truth about God and his relationship to the world and more especially to man whom he made in his image. The Puritans, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Puritans, or aren't you? you familiar with Puritans? Puritans are known to have defined theology as the art of living coram deo. Does anyone know what that term means? Coram deo? Uh, before the face of God or before the presence of God. So living coram deo is living in the face of God or before the face of God. It's just another way of saying living with a consciousness of God's presence. Living with a consciousness of God's presence. In whatever we think, say, and do, we are reminding ourselves that God knows what we are thinking. God sees what we are doing. God has a view about the choices we are making. There's always a consciousness of God. That is living coram deo. We therefore cannot live well without thinking well. And we cannot think well without God being at the center of our thinking. To be ungodly, and we began by reading Psalm 14, which speaks in these terms, to be ungodly is to banish God from our thinking. To banish God from our thinking. But to live in a godly way is to have God in our thoughts, God in our consciousness. As believers, we think out of God, and we believe that all things are related to this God. So that is what theology entails. And um, uh, godliness is um, uh, living uh, with God as the center of our lives. You know, we think in terms of what he thinks, what he wants. We, we love the things he loves. We make the choices he wants us to make. Uh, so we live with reference to God. And um, sometimes godliness is therefore defined as uh, uh, living in the fear of God. That doesn't just mean that we are afraid of God, but that we respect him, we, we honor him. We therefore won't live in a way that will displease him because we, 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 we respect him. But that is also what it means to be pious, you know, and uh, the word piety is just the old word for, for godliness. Yeah. Okay. So I want us to consider two things regarding theology as we introduce the subject. Uh, the first is the centrality of the doctrine and knowledge of God, the centrality of the doctrine of the, the doctrine and knowledge of God. And under this, we want to note four things. First, the knowledge of God is the greatest privilege we possess. To know God is the greatest privilege we possess. And I want us to read Jeremiah 9 and verse 24, as we think about that. The, the, the prophet says, but let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and honors me. 
that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. If we would glory in anything, if we would be proud about anything, it must be about the fact that we know God, the greatest being in the universe, the most important being in the universe. If God is the greatest, if God is the most important, if God is the most majestic, it follows, doesn't it, that to know him, to relate to him, is the greatest privilege you and I can ever have. That is the first thing I want us to stress. Secondly, the knowledge of God lies at the heart of theology, at the heart of covenant theology. Now, the focus of the covenant structure of the Bible is the concept of being restored into fellowship with God. God created man upright. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 says, but man has gone in search of many schemes. Out of the hand of God, he was created upright. But he did not continue to live an, as an upright uh, person. He strayed from the ways of God. And for that reason, God put in place the plan he had conceived in eternity to restore man back to himself. God, if you like, entered into a covenant with man that if he would repent and turn away from his sin, he would be given salvation. He would be forgiven. And part of what being forgiven and being forgiven, being, being given salvation, uh, would involve knowing God, coming to God, turning away from the things that have set us away from God, apart from God, and knowing this God, and learning to relate to him and to live according to his precepts. That's what that covenant demands. So the knowledge of God lies at the heart of the whole of covenant theology. The third point I want to make as a preliminary is that the knowledge of God is central to salvation in Jesus Christ. It is central to salvation. John 17 verse 3 says, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ saying it, this is eternal life. What is eternal life? That they may know you and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is eternal life. That they may know you. In Philippians 3 and verse 10, the Lord Jesus, or rather the Apostle Paul, declared as his motto and intention in life to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. The knowledge of God is central to salvation in Christ Jesus. And when we speak about the knowledge of God, and we'll go into some depth about it, uh, J.I. Parker warns that we must beware of the spectator knowledge of God. The spectator knowledge of God. We can become guilty of being uh, spectators, okay? Uh, this is what the knowledge of God is about, and we, we stand afar from it, and we are 
watching it doesn't affect us, doesn't move us, but we are there to watch it. We must beware of the spectator knowledge of God. Our knowledge of God must be notional, it must be experiential, it must be real. Our experience of salvation demands that. The knowledge of God is therefore the key element to our Christian growth. If we are just spectators, we won't really grow. We won't really know God as we ought to know him. We must experience this God. And it is as we experience him that we will grow. So that's the first point, the centrality of the doctrine and knowledge of God. Second point, and we are going to look at four more things in regard to this. The right approach to the doctrine of the knowledge of God. What is the right approach? What kind of attitude should we come with as we engage with this exalted subject? Well, four things. First, we must approach the subject in the posture of dependency. We must approach the subject in the posture of dependency. We stop talking to the Bible merely. Rather, we start to listen to what it is saying, okay? We, we don't come to this subject with our ideas and with intent to impose those ideas upon the course. No, no. When we study theology, we basically are studying God's word and we want that word to speak to us. So that is the first attitude we ought to display as we uh, approach theology. The second attitude we ought to display is we must approach the subject with humility and repentance. With humility and repentance. Our subject matter is God. This great and majestic and holy being. That is our subject. And it is said that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of God. It's a fearful thing. Now, when we come before him, therefore, we must do it with humility. And you cannot come before this God and not see on the one hand how holy, how pure he is, and on the other, how sinful and weak you are. So if, as you approach him, you see your own smallness and littleness and sin, that must move you to humility and repentance. Thirdly, we must approach the subject with a doxological attitude. A doxological attitude. Um, you must know what the word doxology means. Anyone? Does anyone? Worship. worship, yes. So we must approach the subject with a worshipful attitude. Not just with some dry academic interest. You must come to this subject with a worshipful or doxological attitude. And then fourthly and finally, we must approach the subject pastorally. Pastorally. 
with intent to bring pastoral emphasis or application. In other words, you need to ask yourself, well, this thing that I have learned about God, how does it affect me? How does it help me? You must approach the subject pastorally. So that's the introduction. Okay, I just want to understand the question. You are saying his view was that we always need to think of God as being loving and caring and, and not think in any other terms. Of course, uh, the, that attitude is unfortunate. Um, it's, it's as if he wants to make God in his own image. <laughs> okay? So it's not God who is telling him about who he is. He wants to tell God what he must be. Now, it's true to say that God is loving, and he always will be loving, but surely there are ever so many other things that the Bible tells us about God. God hates sin, for example. Sometimes God even allows evil uh, to serve his purpose. And although we cannot explain why he would do that, um, in theology we call that a question of theodicy, uh, we cannot uh, answer the question why he will, always, as, uh, he will always allow that, but he is God, he can do what he wants. And um, God would see genocide as an evil. Okay? And the problem with that friend is that he was ascribing the action to God. But God created man to be free and to make choices. And in those particular instances, he chooses to commit suicide, I mean genocide. And he's going to answer to God for that. So this friend fell short of seeing that, okay? Uh, so if people have committed genocide, they are guilty for so doing. Now, they are going to answer to God, and God will punish them for it. His thoughts didn't allow him to go beyond his own thinking about what God should be. He fell short of seeing that this God is also a just God. So yes, they've committed genocide. God has let them commit it. But it's not because he tolerates sin. And it will be clear uh, when eventually they stand before him to give an account that he does not tolerate sin. They'll pay for it. And they'll pay for it fully. So I think he suffered from the problem of defining in his own image what God must be and not allowing God himself to tell him what he must be. Yeah. The truth, of course, is first of all to be read or heard. Um, and once you read it or hear it, you must not stop at that. You must meditate on it, okay? And when you meditate on the truth, you are basically interrogating it. What does it mean? Uh, how does it affect me? Uh, what uh, duties does it, what duties devolve upon me? Uh, do I need to depend of anything? Uh, do I need to thank God for anything or praise him for anything? Uh, so you meditate. And uh, what you are doing when you meditate is that you are bringing the truth from your head to your heart. And then you make it a matter for prayer. So you've read or heard, you must now meditate and you must now pray and then go on to act upon those things that you are your duty to do. So if you don't end up 
merely reading or hearing, but go on to meditate, to pray, and to act, you will always experience theology you know, in, your, in your life. All right. Let's go on. And uh, I now want us to uh, begin looking at the, the existence of God. And we'll begin by reading from Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, and you all know verse 1 very well, I'm sure. What does it say? All right, Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want you to note that. Now, I want us to reflect on that verse as we think about the existence of God. And what we notice, first of all, is that the verse reveals the fact that God exists. It reveals the fact that God exists. Now, when we say God exists, what do we mean? We mean that he is. God is is. We mean that he lives and people who don't exist, they might have once existed but they no longer do. We, we normally say they are dead. Okay? They are not there anymore. They are dead. But God is. God is there. Um, if you've heard of Francis Schaeffer you will have come across a book he's written called The God Who Is There. Okay? He exists. He is there. He is living. He is actual being. Now, he is different from the created things. Huh? Here in verse 1, we see a contrast, don't we? In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So God, the creator, and the created things, the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth once were not. <laughs> okay? They came into being when God created them when God brought them into being. But God never ever was in a situation where he was not. He is always there. He has always been there. He exists. He exists in the absolute sense of that word. You were once not there. God has always been. In that sense, he is different from the created things, heaven and earth. You will also notice that this God who exists is a, a person. Okay? He is a person. He is not a thing or just a power or just an influence or just some force or energy. He is a person. He lives. We've already made that point. But he doesn't just live. He thinks. He acts. He creates. Notice what he is doing here. In the beginning, God created. God did something. He created. He who was a living person 
created. So the verse reveals that God exists. That's the first thing we know. Secondly, we also notice from the verse that his existence is taken for granted. In other words, it is presupposed. It is presupposed. Here, there is no attempt to prove the fact that he exists. That's not how the Bible begins. It doesn't begin with proving that God exists. It takes it for granted that he is. It takes it for granted. In apologetics, there is a distinction made between what is known as presuppositional apologetics and uh, evidentialist apologetics. Now, it's not a case of right and wrong, <laughs> okay? It's a case of just defining things as they are. There is an apologetics that is presuppositional. The best representative of that apologetics is or was Cornelius Van Til. You might have heard of that theologian. We begin reading the Bible and reflecting upon God with the presupposition that he exists. And we don't take any time to try and prove that because the Bible doesn't take any time to try and prove that. God doesn't waste time trying to prove that. He takes it for granted that we know. Why would he take it for granted that we know? Well, he made us in his image. There is something of God in us. So every one of us has a consciousness of this God in whose image we are created. So you can understand why we could, in fact, begin our reflection and study of God with a presupposition. That's how the Bible begins. His existence is taken for granted or presupposed. The third thing, third point I want us to note is that his existence can nonetheless be proved. Although it is taken for granted, it can nonetheless be proved. There are people, after all, who even though it is plain that God exists, their consciences tell them so, everything outside of them tells them so, but they still say that there is no God. They still don't think that there is a God. There are people like that. And there are people like that because there is foolishness in their hearts. Sin has entered their hearts and blinded them, blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts and they suppress the truth that is obvious. For them, proofs become all the more urgent and important. Are you with me? Proof become, becomes all the more important and urgent. Uh, you might have heard of uh, uh, C.S. Lewis. He was a uh, uh, a philosopher in his own right. Before he was converted, of course, he did not believe in God. He did not believe in the existence of God. And what brought him to faith was someone who took the time to demonstrate for him, to prove to him in a very logical way 
that God exists. And there is place for that. So I want us to take a bit of time to look at some of the proofs that have been advanced in demonstration of the existence of God. So the Bible itself begins with a presupposition that God exists. But men, men have gone beyond that to demonstrate that this that the Bible presupposes is true. So there are a number of proofs that have been advanced. And I want us to, to work through that. The best proof, the first and the best proof for believers is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's the best proof that God exists. The revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to reflect on two verses. Um, the first is John chapter 1 verse 1 through to 14. I'm interested in opening up just two verses from there, verse 1 and verse 14. Verse 1 acknowledges the fact that in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, we are told that the Word became flesh. So note the connection. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible presupposes the existence of that God. In verse 14, we are told the Word became flesh. That word, of course, is a reference to Jesus Christ. He became flesh. He was God. He became flesh. And because he became flesh, men could see him. He dwelt with them. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And a God who was with us, not invisibly, but visibly. Are you with me? Men could see him. John testifies in this way, to that effect. Um, that which was from the beginning, which we have seen and which we have touched, okay? It was the particular uh, privilege of the apostles to be first-hand witnesses. They, they saw with their own eyes. They touched him. They lived with him, they worked with him, they saw him because he became flesh. He became visible. So that which was from the beginning, invisible then, became visible. God made himself visible. That's the best proof. Hebrews 1 and verse 3 speaks about Jesus Christ as being the exact representation of the being of God. The exact representation of the being of God. So, Jesus 
wasn't just some being who was unconnected with God who came to talk about God. He was God become flesh. He was the invisible God who made himself visible so men could see. Then let's look at John chapter 1 and verse 18. We are told concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that he, he was from the bosom of the Father. And he who was from the bosom of the Father has made him known. Okay? He has made him known. That word, he has made him known. Some versions would say he has declared him. Same word from which we derive the word exegesis. Okay? What do we do when we exegete a passage? We, we draw out its meaning. We don't read meaning into it. We draw out its meaning. And Jesus came to draw out the meaning, to, to exp expose the meaning, to expose God. If he was not clear, as people tried to look for him and find him in general revelation, if he was not clear there, well, he must be clear here because this God has become flesh and this flesh is now declaring him, making him known, exegeting him so it would become clear to men as to his existence and as to who he really was. So that is the first proof I want to speak about, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second proof of the existence of God we will refer to as the, the, the classical proofs, okay, the classical proofs. And it is under this category that we will speak about those five proofs the first classical proof of the existence of God is the ontological, the ontological proof, the ontological argument. And this was popularized by a theologian called Anselm, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury in those days. And the argument purports to be an a priori proof of God's existence. Now, are we familiar uh, with this word a priori? As we go along, we'll talk about a posteriori. A priori. Anyone familiar with the word? Or you can simply say um, an argument from... Um, self-demonstrating, um, self-demonstrating proofs, okay? Self-evident, uh, self-evident propositions. So you, you haven't had to do an experiment to demonstrate that something is true. It is self-evident. It's there for people to see for themselves. It's, it's, it's self-evident. It's self so reasoning from self-evident propositions, that is to reason a priori. And that term is used particularly in, in, in philosophy, in philosophical uh, thinking. So if you like, when you look at God, you, you really don't need to uh, to see evidence from 
uh, outside of yourself. Uh, you, you don't need to see evidence displayed before you out there. Uh, you know, the, the evidence for his existence is, is self-evident. It's a priori. Um, and Anselm would then start with, you know, the, the premises, um, such as, uh, you know, all, all things uh, exist because they have a cause. You know, I exist because something brought me into being. Therefore, whatever brought me into being exists. <laughs> You know, it's, it's self-evident. Um, that's the ontological argument, which purely by logical means, uh, by a process of reasoning, you can come to the conclusion that God is. That's the ontological argument, okay? The ontological argument, you know, you're arguing from self-evident propositions you can go through a logical process, okay? Just thinking by yourself. You know, whatever is, must have been caused, okay? Everything that is, must have come about, you know, because they were caused. Um, I am, <laughs> okay? Because I was caused, therefore, there must be a causer, <laughs> all right? There must be a cause. If, if, if everything that <coughs> exists, exists because they were caused, and I am because I was caused, therefore there must have been a causer, someone who brought me about, and someone who must have brought everything about. Um, I think it's Aristotle who spoke in terms of the one, <laughs> okay? Never called him God. But through a process of reasoning, he came to the view that there must have been that one in whom everything consists, in whom everything is held together, he, he, he brings them about and they're held together in him, calls him the one, um, the, the principal causer of all things. He didn't call him God, but we call him God. D does that make sense? Okay. That's the ontological argument. Then there is the cosmological argument, okay, the cosmological argument. The word cosmos, um, from the Greek, means world, more precisely an orderly world, okay? An orderly world. So the cosmological argument basically says that all things in nature depend on something else for their existence. And that the whole cosmos must therefore, must therefore depend not on itself, but on something else that is independent of it, okay? So if you look at the cosmos, you know, everything depends on something else, okay? Um, everything, there, there is nothing in the cosmos that is independent uh, of other things in the, in, in the cosmos, within the cosmos. Um, there is this interdependency. Um, you know, look at your own existence. Uh, it didn't just happen. You, you had parents, <laughs> okay? who were the means uh, of bringing you about. And, and we can say the same thing about everything else that we see in the universe. So that being the case, 
you know, this universe must have been brought about by something outside of itself. And the argument goes that thing by which they were brought about is God. There is a biblical commentary on that from Acts chapter 17. In him we live and move and have our being. Okay? In him we live and move and have our being. The, 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 the ontological argument is by a process of reasoning. Okay, so you come to the conclusion merely or purely by a process of reasoning. Whereas the cosmological argument, it is by a process of observation. Okay, um, you know, when we look at the universe, what we observe is that uh, the, 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 the universe is, uh, or the, cos the, the cosmos is interdependent. Um, this brings about this, and this brings about this, and this survives because of you know, this provision. You know, that's how the cosmos survives. So the cosmos itself comes about through some efficient cause. And that efficient cause is, is God. Uh, Romans 1 verse 19 and 20 is actually the best uh, proof text for that. Where Paul is arguing that uh, when you look at the, the, the cosmos, that it points to a causa. <laughs> Listen to how he puts it. He says in verse 19, what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Uh, so in Paul's view, what exists points to God. Um, so he starts from the cosmos, you know, back to God. The, the, ontolo the ontological argument doesn't start with the cosmos. Uh, the ontological argument starts with just a process of self-reasoning, and you come to that conclusion. All right, uh, let's go on. We have the Teleological argument. Teleological argument. Uh, teleological from the word telos. Telos means end or purpose. So if a plan is purposeful, we could say that uh, it is teleological. As a, it has a purpose. It's, uh, it's, it's not purposeless. Uh, you know, it has an end, it has an aim, um, it's, it's purposeful. So the, the teleological argument says when you, when you look at nature, uh, it, 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 it looks like it's, it's, it's well organized, you know. Everything in the universe seems to, to, to have a purpose, to, to have an end. And all of them together seem to be working toward one you know, big goal or, or purpose. So that there is this design, this intelligent design, uh, points to some intelligent designer, <laughs> okay? Uh, the, the universe is not haphazard, everything seems to be working to, to work in an orderly fashion. Look at the way the, the planets function, where they are positioned. Look at the, 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 the positional relationship between the Earth and the Sun. 
you know, it's, it's, you know, it, they're, they're, they're just at the right position. You know, if, if the sun, you know, came a bit closer, too close to the, to the earth, you know, we would probably all be burnt out, <laughs> you know. Um, it's just at the right angle, just in the right place. Um, it, it rises at the right time and uh, it has a purpose to serve in relation to the earth. It's no doubt serving other purposes in relation to other planets that revolve around it, but we couldn't do without the sun. Um, everything has a purpose, and that points to a designer. So that's the teleological argument. Yeah, the, it's, it's about what they're emphasizing. The, the cosmological argument is, is, is saying, you know, the, the, the cosmos operates in terms of causes and effects, you know, within the cosmos. You know, the, the effects are caused by some things. So the cosmos itself is an effect which has been caused by a causa, God. That's what is being emphasized. The, the telos, the teleological argument, is saying this thing that has been caused has a purpose to serve. And when you look at how it functions, it doesn't seem to be aimless, okay? It is serving some, some purpose. So the very fact that there, is a, that there is a purpose being served points to someone who designed that purpose. Like uh, if you design something, um, it will serve the purpose for which you have designed it. Uh, so similarly, the universe serves a purpose. Human beings who live here on earth you know, serve a purpose and uh, God designed that purpose for them. So the purpose points to someone who designed the purpose, and that is God. All right, the next uh, classical argument is known as the, the historical argument. The historical argument. What is the historical argument about? Well, the, the historical argument basically states that uh, the, the world, the universe, uh, is, is, is data, <laughs> okay? He, history is not a, a study into nothingness. History is a study of, of what is, okay? And uh, especially what human beings have done. And we can, we can trace that data from, from, the, from the time man was created right up to this moment. The data is there. <laughs> um, and the existence of that data uh, points to uh, a, a God who put people who make history to be there. And then finally, we have the moral argument. And uh, the moral argument argues from the reality of moral laws that are already in existence, okay? Uh, first of all, you find that uh, human beings have a moral consciousness, even where they don't have written codes, okay? They don't have written codes. They have nothing written on paper or stone. And yet there is an unspoken law. And it is unspoken because, in fact, according to Romans 2 verse 15, it's written on their consciences, okay? So every human being knows what is wrong and what is right because God has written the moral code on their hearts. But more than that, they're not just written on their hearts. Uh, we, we find laws all over the place among humans. Um, we find uh, 
laws written on tablets, on a tablet of stone, the Ten Commandments started out that way, uh, also in the Bible. We find other written codes. Um, did you ever hear of what is known as the Code of Hammurabi? Yeah. Um, and, and when you look at that code, the, there is morality, and therefore there is a, a semblance between some of the codes there and the Ten Commandments. Um, because they are both reflecting a code that God first wrote on the hearts of men. So the argument is that because there is the presence of such moral codes, they point to the presence of a moral giver, okay? The existence of a, of a moral giver. So those are the, the classical arguments for the existence of God. If, if there's a moral code, there's a moral consciousness, but then there is the total depravity of man. And uh, because of total depravity, the argument is that men are therefore dead spiritually. Should, should they have this moral consciousness? On the one hand, if they are actually dead, I think that's the question, isn't it? I think the right way of uh, understanding total depravity is not that we are as bad as we can possibly be. That's not the right way of understanding it. The right way of understanding it is that we are not as bad as we could possibly be. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can be bad, but we are not, <laughs> okay? Um, the, the man is damaged, but we can still see the ruins, <laughs> okay? There are still signs of his existence, okay? So although he is depraved, the, the totality of that depravity simply emphasizes that there is no part of his being that has not been uh, defiled. The mind has been defiled, the emotions have been defiled, the will has been defiled, the body has been defiled. Nothing has been left untouched, okay? It's total in that sense. It is not total in the sense that you you are you know you, you, you are completely out of existence. <laughs> okay? There they are still there is still a semblance of the image of God. The image has been damaged, but it's not been totally erased. <laughs> okay? You can still see the ruins of that image. <laughs> do, do, do you get the point? And then you, you live in a world where God has put laws, okay? Um, you, you're unconscious, although you're totally depraved, but you, you still have a conscience, which also speaks, which is also a sign of the fact that you are not as bad as you could possibly be. Uh, so when you do something wrong, you can still feel guilty uh, about it. Okay. So total depravity doesn't teach that you are as bad as you could possibly be. It teaches that every aspect of your being has been touched by sin. So for that reason, you can still sense the law. <laughs> you can still respond to the law. You may not have the power, the ability to do what the law is telling you to do, but you can still feel it. You can still sense it. You can still be convicted of, of sin. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, the, there are consciences that can be seared <laughs> as with a hot iron. 
um, it is, doesn't speak of the experience of the whole humanity, <laughs> okay? It may describe a particular group um, for whatever reason, you know, their consciences may be seared. I think the fact that they don't feel guilty is debatable, <laughs> you know? Uh, the fact that they do wrong and they do it with impunity may not be contested. But is it true to say that they don't feel guilty? I really doubt it. Um, how is it that if you take them the gospel and what such people lack is, uh, you know, light, the, the light of conscience is not as bright as the light of the word, <laughs> okay? The light of conscience falls in the realm of general revelation. So it's not as, as bright as the light of special revelation. Um, and that light can be suppressed you know, more easily and the conscience can be seared and people don't feel as embarrassed and as guilty as they should. And they need exposure to better light, to more light, in order for them to see their wrongs <laughs> more. So what I, 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 I think is um, that that's a case of men whose consciences are seared. Don't they feel guilty? I really doubt that they don't. <laughs> Um, because, you know, Romans chapter 2 says the conscience has condemned them. Uh, the, the conscience condemns all human beings. So if you go and sit down with those people and really ask them what they feel about it, uh, they will probably tell you that, you know, they do feel bad about taking someone's life, okay, but they have trained their consciences not to be bothered about it, okay? So in their heart of heart, they feel the discomfort, okay? But what is happening there is Romans 1 verse 18. They suppress the truth. The truth as taught to them by their consciences. Maybe they have even heard someone preaching against what they do. They just suppress it, but it doesn't mean they don't feel it. So I really think the argument that they don't feel guilty is debatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, 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 the moral values may be applied uh, um, in an unjust way, <laughs> but the very fact that they don't take some lives, <laughs> but they take others, you know, shows you what is going on in their consciences. <laughs> There is only one law, by the way. I thought I should, I should make this clear. That law was first written on the hearts of men when Adam was created, okay? We are all born with it. So some people will never receive exposure to the gospel, and some people will never see the Bible so may, they may not have the privilege of being exposed to that superior account of the law. It doesn't mean they have no law. The law is one, which is why at the judgment on the last day, we can all stand before God. No one will say, but I never heard the gospel, or I, I never heard the, the, the Bible's teaching. I, I never... No one is going to argue in that way. Um, all of us will be measured against the law that God wrote on our hearts. Some of us will have it more clearly because we also read about that same law in the Bible. Okay, some might have read it you know, in a different uh, code, like the code of Hammurabi. <laughs> you see the point. Um, but it's, it's an expression of that one law that God put on our hearts. 
It has to be that way, otherwise the judgment won't be fair. <laughs> the, the standard against which we are all being judged must be the same. But it's not just that standard that will be considered, it's the facts of the case. Okay, if I killed a person, I killed a person. And that fact is going to be brought uh, before, before God and it will be measured against this standard of morality, which we all have written clearly on 